Hi everyone, Nick here with Ablecine. In this video, we're going to have a look at a very hotly anticipated camera from Panasonic, the new EVA1, or EVA1 as many call it. This is a new compact cinema camera from Panasonic with a super 35mm sized image sensor at 5.7K resolution for a 4K image capture, which we'll talk a little bit more about in just a second. Uh, this camera's compact body size makes it an ideal camera for special applications like gimbal, drone, or jib, uh, but it also makes it a really great camera for a run and gun type workflow or any other sort of documentary style shooting. Uh, we're going to drill down pretty close into these tech specs here. It'll be from more of a perspective of actually working with the camera. All right, well, let's have a closer look. Okay, so as I had mentioned, this is a 5.7K camera, uh, but when we go into the actual menu and load up the system settings where we check to see what our resolution and codec is set for, you'll notice that the actual main pixel uh, recording mode doesn't give us 5.7K as an option. Now the reason that Panasonic have done this uh, is very in-depth and technical, but the short version is to say uh, there's an argument to be made with the way that all of the Bayer filter array sensors that we use in modern digital cinema cameras uh, capture color, that they may not be giving us exactly a true-to-life resolution at the numbers that they say. Panasonic are doing a technique called oversampling in this case so that they have a little bit of extra headroom and they can use that to get what they say is a much more true to life, more natural and more rich color response from the camera uh, as well as uh, just a cleaner overall image at 4K. The idea is to over capture so that we can get the best 4K image possible. That said, the resolution options that we have available to us on the camera do cover a pretty wide range. Uh, we've got our DCI 4K or 4096 by 2160, as well as Ultra HD, and then the common flavors of 2K theatrical or uh, DCI 2K and standard HD uh, 1920 by 1080 resolutions. All of those record modes uh, are available in the uh, long GOP uh, Panasonic codecs. So we have the option of 100 megabits per second 420 if we're looking to save some card space, or the slightly better 422. Uh, color subsampling and higher bit rate 150 megabit per second, uh, also long gob codec. Now in addition to those 4K modes, the camera does also give us the ability to use a crop on the sensor. Uh, so we can choose just to use a slightly lower resolution in order to increase our frame rates, or we can go into a four-thirds sensor size crop. Uh, now a lot of you might be familiar with similar crop modes on other cameras, uh, but the benefit of doing it to a, a four-thirds standard means that the imager is actually a little bit bigger than what a lot of other companies are doing where it's Super 16 or similar. This is pretty close. Uh, I believe the math comes out to be a little bit under 70% of the imager size that you would have at Super 35, so it's not as uh, harsh on cropping in on your lenses. Uh, in the normal full sensor width, uh, we're looking at normal frame rates, so our system frequency, as Panasonic is going to label it, is just going to be in our typical ranges, uh, normal 2398 and 2997, as well as their film equivalents uh, and their European frame rates too. Uh, the camera is capable of shooting uh, 60 frames per second for sync when you're in 2K and HD modes. Uh, if we're willing to use that 4-3 crop mode, we gain the ability to shoot even higher frame rates. So right away, looking at the exterior of the camera, we can see that it does have some very compact ergonomics uh, and a lot of helpful usability uh, features for people who are in a kind of a one-person band sort of situation or single camera operator situation. Uh, it's, again, very compact. Uh, the camera has a grip on the side that allows you to control the menu uh, as well as start and stop the camera. Uh, and it has two of the nine user assignable buttons. So the camera is very configurable and you have a lot of ways to make it work exactly the way that you'd like to work. Uh, it does come with an EF mount standard, which is capable of doing a one-shot autofocus feature. So there's no continuous autofocus at this time, uh, but the EF mount does give you a very wide range of lenses to choose from, from very inexpensive and uh, easy to get a hold of still photo glass up to high-end cinema glass that's been converted to EF mount and kind of anything in between that has that capability. So again, speaking about the versatility and ergonomics of the camera, there are four main ways that you can control the menu through the camera. So we have uh, a little jog wheel uh, plus a menu and exit button on the side of the camera. Those are also repeated on the grip. We've got exit and menu buttons as well as that same jog wheel that can do all the same controlling. Uh, but in addition to that, the LCD viewfinder that Panasonic have given us is a touch screen. So we can just tap exactly what settings we want to change. A uh, couple of things that you'll notice right away when we're controlling the camera uh, is the uh, heritage that this camera has in its um, from its Vericam siblings. In a lot of ways, it's a little bit closer to the higher end of Panasonic setup uh, than maybe some of their other more prosumer offerings, and you can really see that uh, in this home screen here, which again can be controlled using the wheel to rotate through, or we can just reach up and tap exactly what we want to do, 
accessing those settings very simply. So just taking a quick tour of the exterior of the body, uh, we have all the controls that you would expect to see in terms of uh, the iris control for your electronically controlled EF lenses, a plethora of user switches, as I'd mentioned, easy to configure. Anything with a number on the camera body or the grip can be reassigned in the menu, uh, but it does have some default settings which you can see labeled on here. Some of the buttons are contact sensitive, such as the uh, third user key here, which functions as kind of an info or status button when you are in the home menu. So when you've pulled up that menu, we can at a glance see some of the basic settings of the camera, uh, what we've set our user switches to, or anything else that we might just need to know but not necessarily change anything on. All the things that you would expect to see on any kind of camera geared towards single operating use are here. There's a very powerful internal ND filter system uh, which uses a uh, stacked setup of NDs uh, to achieve a variety of different levels of control as well as controlling the infrared cut filter that all uh, digital CMOS style sensor cameras have. That actually allows the Panasonic EVA1 to use a really unique feature where you could take that out entirely. So if you had to do some specialty infrared photography or I should say infrared video, uh, you can have that removed and then stack whatever other filters that you need to put in front of the lens. Very unique feature. I don't know of any other camera system that allows you to take that out with the electronic filter wheel. On most other camera systems, that'd be an expensive and permanent modification. So it would be a very niche sort of thing. Uh, basic audio controls are provided on the exterior of the camera. Uh, we just have simple level controls as well as whether or not we want to set the channel to be managed manually or uh, automatically. Uh, any further settings like uh, providing phantom power over the XLRs and that sort of thing are set in the main menus. Uh, speaking of, the uh, XLRs have been placed on the body specifically, so if you need to ditch the top handle or any of the other accessories, you're not giving up the ability to process audio, which is a bit, definitely a big boon, especially in those applications where the camera is going to be mounted uh, in a gimbal or another device. Speaking of removing that top handle, it's very convenient as Panasonic have given us a couple of thumb screws, and when you take that off, you'll find that there's uh, a number of other quarter 20 mounting holes, so it's going to be very easy for third-party manufacturers to design cheese plates and other accessories to make this camera play nice in those sort of production environments. Uh, Panasonic have put a USB 2.0 port here, both for service, but also a secondary port that can be used with their WM50 wireless adapter. Uh, they'll have a, a smartphone and tablet app coming out uh, in order to provide that wireless connectivity that's becoming more and more common in the industry. A great boon to have, uh, again, especially if you have that camera up in a crane or a jib, uh, it's going to be a lot easier to change those settings wirelessly than to have to have it come down every time you need to adjust it. Um, as far as input and output, the camera is looking at one SDI port, which is 6G, uh, and an HDMI 2.0 port. So both of those are capable of sending out a 4K signal if whatever you have on the other end is able to receive it. Uh, and they are independently processable, which is nice, especially for a lot of cameras in this price range. That's not a super common feature. You have your standard headphone port, which is going to let you monitor those audio channels, and a timecode port, which is configurable between in and out. Some camera systems make that an additional thing, and a lot of camera systems in this price range just don't have it, uh, but it's very useful for syncing second system sound or syncing multiple cameras together, so I appreciate that Panasonic have added it in here.